All right, that's the title of my sermon tonight. The title of my sermon comes from 1 Corinthians 3, 1. Uh, uh, Babes in Christ. Babes in Christ. Now, I remember when I first had kids, uh, you know, you, you first start having kids, you start to see how they're behaving, you know, obviously the, the, the misbehavior. <laughs> and I remember speaking to uh, Mark Tossel, who was my, uh, my sending bishop who ordained me, and when we were talking about our kids, we were saying, oh, you know what, I've got to start listing down all the things that my kid does because I'm sure one day it'll make a really great sermon. <laughs> right? just, just comparing, you know, the good things they do, the bad things they do. I'm just talking today about the bad things that kids do. But the way children behave and how we can compare it to spiritual children, right, in the sense of spiritual babes in Christ, uh, which are really just people walking in the flesh. So this sermon will be obviously centered around my family in terms of the examples that I see in, in my children. But I'm just going to go through just 10 things I see in my own children uh, that, that, are, that are characteristics of babes in Christ. You know, when we see children, we see things that they do, which are things we should strive to avoid to do. Uh, and I've just got 10 examples that I wanted to go through today as we go through them. And I want you to reflect on these. And if, we, if you have any of these attributes, these are the things we need to grow out of as spiritual, um, uh, spiritual children in Christ. We need to grow and put away these things. So that's the title of my sermon. So the first thing, I've got 10 things to go through. The first one I've, I've got is sweet foods. If you think about what children like, children, they, they, they want everything sweet. I'm sure if my kids had the choice, you know, they would want to eat ice cream, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that would be enough, right? That's what children are like. And that's what spiritual children can be like too. Spiritual children, they just want their spiritual food all nice and sweet. They don't like it salty, you know, they, they like it sweet and, and milky as opposed to strong meat as well. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3 where I get the title of my sermon from. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So why, why can we notice when we look at children and what they do, it's like spiritual children, because children, they, they haven't grown out of those fleshly inhibitions, right? They just, they just do what the flesh feels like and they just do it. So they're living in the flesh. And that's what a babe in Christ is. A babe in Christ is somebody that hasn't grown in their faith where they're walking in the spirit. They're walking in the flesh. And that's why even though they're physically an adult, there are attributes that children have because they're still walking in the flesh, right? They're not walking in the spirit and being spiritual, but rather carnal. So carnal is when you're fleshly, right? That's the body, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. So you see spiritual children. So when it comes to children, yeah, they like sweet things. It's not necessarily bad as sweet things. There's a place for sweet things. You know, there's a place for milk. But when it comes to spiritual children, what's a characteristic of a spiritual child? It's everything they want is sweet. Everything they want is nice, right? as opposed to meat. So even when it comes to the doctrine and teaching, they want everything to be to feel good and to sound sweet. They don't want to be told off. They don't want things that they have to chew on. This is a characteristic of a babe in Christ. He says, For ye are yet carnal, for, where, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? See, so there's nothing necessarily wrong with sweet food there's a place for it it's like here in first timothy first peter 2 there's not a, it's not bad milk because there is a place for it as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby if so be you have tasted that the lord is gracious but see as a spiritual child you don't want to you know be in the faith for a long time and just keep the milk is all you ever want the milk is all you ever get you want to progress past that and start thinking about the strong meat of the word. Whereas when you come along strong meat, and it's just like, oh, because you know how, for example, children, uh, and for those of you who have children, when you start feeding them meat and you start feeding them solids, it's like it's too much work for them, right? They, they, they see the meat, you know what I mean? They don't really want to chew on that meat, or you know, they don't like it because it takes too much work. But when it's all nice and soft, you know, mashed potatoes, mashed this, mashed that, that's how babies want it. It's the same with spiritual babies. They don't want to chew on this strong meat. So 
a babe in Christ, when they come across strong meat doctrine, they just don't want to deal with it. They're like, oh, it's too much to think about. Right? But we don't want to stay as spiritual children. We want to grow and tackle that strong meat and try and figure it out so that we know um, what we believe. Hebrews 5, look at this. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So what is Paul saying here in, the, in, the, uh, in, in Hebrews? He's saying there comes a point where you should be somebody teaching somebody else. But you haven't gotten to that point yet. You still have need of milk and still need to grow because you're a babe in Christ. But you've been a babe in Christ for so long, you really should be a teacher by this point. You should be able to teach others your faith and teach, uh, be in a position of teaching. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. So you can see how we can compare this spiritual food, which is the word and preaching of the word, with you know, the actual physical food of milk and meat. For he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now that's a really important point, that in the spiritual life, we don't just grow spiritually just based on time. Right? How do you grow in the spiritual realm? It's by reason of use. It's you actually meditating on the Word, preaching the Word, teaching the Word, thinking on the Word, is as you grow in Christ, right? It's not just time. How many times have you heard people say things like, well, I've been a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years. But if they're not using the word, you know, if they're not doing anything with it, then they're still a babe in Christ because they're not growing. They've just been saved for a long time. So it's not like the physical realm, right? Where children, they will grow regardless, right? But in the spiritual realm, people only grow when they use the word they, they absorb it and they preach it. So that's the first one. You know, children only just like sweet things. You know, they don't like to eat, the, you know, they don't like to eat their veggies. You know, you have to force them to eat their veggies. And, and just a practical tip for those of you who have children, you, you, you have to force your children to eat stuff. You know, like if you're a picky eater yourself, you're going to have big troubles with your children because you need, you need to force them to eat it too. So it's the same with my, my kids. You know, did they like eating, you know, sauerkraut? You know, did they like eating spinach when we first gave it to them? Did they like? Of course not. But some parents, they feed their kids stuff, and they're like, oh, my kid doesn't like this. My kid doesn't. Well, of course they don't like it, because they're kids. You, know, you need to teach them to like it, so you force them to eat it. You know, and sometimes you have to spank them if they're not going to put it in their mouth, and you force them to put it in their mouth. And surprisingly enough, after a while, they like it. I don't know, I don't know what happened. It's, you know, it's an acquired taste, but you know, the, that's why people, sometimes they sit with my kids, and they just think, I can't believe your kids are eating this stuff. That's because we forced them to eat it, and now they like it. You know, now they'll eat it. Or maybe in their head, they don't have a choice, right? They have to eat it. So, s sweet food. Number two is children hate, they hate being washed. I don't know if all kids are like this, but, but specifically the head. You know, I, I don't know if your kids are like this, but you know, they, they'll, they'll have fun like, like, you know, playing with the water. I'm, so, I'm talking about young kids, you know, they, like you'll sit them in the bath and they'll be fine. But once they start getting their head wet, is, is they just, my kids just freak out. Like sometimes, sometimes Elizabeth just has to like force them under the tongue, just like quickly and they're just all freaking out, trying to get their head washed. So, so what I'm trying to draw here is see how the spiritual, they don't like to get their head washed. And spiritual babes in Christ, they don't like to get their head washed, right? They don't like to be told what they believe is wrong that they've got the wrong misconceptions, that they've got a tradition that they're holding on to. Maybe they learned it from their family's culture. Maybe they learned it from a false religion they used to be part of, but they want to hold on to that. And they don't want to be told that what they're doing is wrong. That's a characteristic of a spiritual babe in Christ. Right? They don't like being washed. How do we get washed in the Bible? Well, it's, it's the, by the word. Look at what it says here in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it, right? Wash it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, should it, be, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So see, we wash our children with physical water. And children often don't like getting their head washed. It's the same with spiritual children. Now, they have a lot of different ideas in their head and the word needs to wash them now, how do you respond when you see something in the Bible that goes against one of your long-held beliefs? 
You know, like one of the ones in my family is just this idea that, uh, you know, I'm still under the authority of my family, you know. So the Bible teaches that when I get married, I'm an independent family now. I'm not part of this big family conglomerate that, you know, your parents and your grandparents and your great-great-grandparents, you know, they, they think that they can still tell you what to do as opposed to being an independent unit. That's often as well. Or, you know, women who want to see college, right? They want to go to college and they want to make a career of themselves. They don't want to follow the will of God, which is marrying, bear children, and guide the house. Now, when you see those scriptures in the Bible, how do you react to that? Do you react like a spiritual babe in Christ and you're like, ah, you know, don't wash my head? Or do you accept it and say, hey, I'm, I'm glad that the, the water of the word is washing me and renewing my mind to make me think how God wants me to think. Now, what's a third one? So I won't recap them for just sake of time. So number three is children are led by their feelings, aren't they? They're led by their feelings. Everything needs to be fun. If you think about children, you know, when they're learning something, it always needs to be a game. It always needs to be fun. You know, everything needs to be, it needs to be exciting. It's the same with spiritual children, right? They, they are led by their feelings as well. And if something's not fun, it's not exciting, then they don't want to do it anymore. You know, we don't want to be like that. We want to be adults where, hey, even if it's not fun, even if it's not exciting, if it takes some hard work, we do it anyway, right? That's how we have to do, that, that's how we want to be spiritually. Now, why don't you want to be led by your feelings, led by your heart? Because your heart is deceitful. The heart is deceitful and above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? When I see that phrase, desperately wicked, it's like they want so bad. They want so bad to be wicked. Whenever I see that desperately wicked, I think about the Sodomites in, in, uh, in, in Genesis 19, when they're like at the door. And even after the angels blind them, they're like still trying to get to the door. It's like, it's like being blinded supernaturally is not enough to stop these, these reprobates from wanting to defile people. It's crazy. Uh, it's story in Genesis 19. But the Bible's saying here, like, our heart can be like that. Our heart desperately wants to be wicked. Why would we want to be led by our heart and what feels good and what, what feels right? Um, another thing that children do, you know, when they're led by their feelings, is they just say the first thing that comes to their mind. You know, like, children do that, don't they? They just, they see something, they just say it, right? They just, that's why, they're just like an open book. And sometimes it's very cute and innocent when it comes to children. But when it comes to spiritual babes in Christ, they do the same thing where they're not slow to speak, slow to wrath. They're not quick to hear. They just say what's on their mind. And you've met people like that, I'm sure, right? There's people are just like, oh, I just tell people what I think. And it's fine to tell people what you think, but it's just whether you've thought about what you're going to say when you think about what you think before actually saying it. And that's the difference between a, a, ch a child, a spiritual babe in Christ, and somebody that's grown in their faith where they're a bit more patient and mature. So led, being led by your feelings. I mean, how else do we as, as spiritual babes do things? I only feel like doing it if it's exciting and fun. I mean, think about church. Think about soul winning. Think about your Bible reading. Think about prayer. I mean, we all know that, hey, these things aren't always the most exciting thing to do, the most fun thing to do, because they take work. They take perseverance. They take a bit of effort. And spiritual babes in Christ don't like that. You know, so we have a prayer meeting and maybe it goes a bit longer than 10 minutes and people are like, oh, it's just it's too hard. You know, I'm going to pray meeting, it's too hard. That's how babes in Christ are. Babes in Christ don't want to do things that are hard. We need to grow out of that and know that, hey, these things are important. Reading your Bible, going soul winning, going to church, spending time in prayer. These are things that take, take, take some work. Another thing that uh, spiritual babes in Christ will do when they're led by their feelings is they judge something based on how it makes them feel. You know, do you, do you ever, uh, you know, uh, even if you come uh, to, to listen to some preaching, and rather than judging the sermon by the content and, and whether it lines up with Scripture, you know, like the Thessalonians saying, hey, these were more noble in Thessalonica because they heard the word and they searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so, and you're saying, hey, this lines up with the Scripture, that's a great sermon, they walk away thinking, well, you know, how did that sermon make me feel? And they judge it based on how it made them feel as opposed to the lessons and the doctrine and the, the, the practical applications that are being taught in it. So we don't want to be led by our feelings. How should we be led? Obviously by the Word of God, by God Himself, because the Word was with God, the Word was God. 
Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. With all thine heart, right? We trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And we lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So you see, we're not led as a spiritual people by our heart, right? We're led by the word of God. Our heart ought to be led by the word, right? We don't judge the word by our heart. I thought this is an interesting passage. It's, it's one that's always spoken to me. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. So you see how the word helps you to know where you're going, right? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Right? So the word leads you where to walk. What's interesting though about this passage is it says, it's a lamp unto my feet, right? And a light unto my path. It's not like a lamp that's lighting the area in front of you. So sometimes, you know, we don't always know what's going to happen in the future. We know who holds the future. But when it comes to the, the word of God leading you to, to make decisions, sometimes you can only see just what's in front of you, right? And you just have to make that decision day by day. You're walking by faith. But as you acknowledge him in all your ways, he'll direct your paths. So you don't always know where you're going to end up, right, in the Christian life. You don't know where you're going to be five years from now, ten years from now. But you know the decision you have to make right now right, tomorrow. You, you know what's right in front of you. And if you keep moving and walking in the will of God, that's how I sort of see it. Every day, you've just got enough light to take the next step. You just keep walking, God is going to direct you. And, and you know, sometimes you'll, you'll end up in places that you have, you have no idea that you, how you even got there. All right, so that's number three. Number four is children are really easily influenced. Really easily influenced, right? And when it comes to spiritual application, because you're not grounded on the word, See, children, they're really easily influenced because they're ignorant, right? They're ignorant of things happening in the world. So people can easily, you know, talk them into things. You can easily lie to children and they believe you, you know, like that sort of thing. It's the same with spiritual children. If you're not knowledgeable in the word of God, you're going to be easily tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. One thought I had as well when children are easily influenced, <clears throat> if you think about children... <clears throat> Their love is easily bought. Do you know what I mean? Like if, if they know somebody, think about how you know, grandparents spoil them or a relative spoils them. It's like whoever buys them toys and buys them gifts and buys them cookies and buys them chocolate, that's the person they love. And when they see them, oh, I'm so excited to see them because they know they're going to get spoiled, right? Well, spiritual babes in Christ are the same. It's often the people that will praise them, say nice things to them, you know, make them feel special. And it's like they're the people that they start to follow. Even though that, pers that person may be a false prophet. You know, that's why they love the Joel Osteens of the world, right? Because they, they love the smooth talking, they make you feel so good, but then they teach you false doctrine. You know, he's not even, he's not even willing to say that certain people are going to hell if they don't believe on Jesus Christ. I mean, what sort of person isn't willing to say that if they claim to be a preacher of God's word? So they're really easily influenced, and it's the same with spiritual children in Christ. It's almost like whoever strokes their ego um, you know, that, that can sort of like get them to go, hey, well, I like that person, even though what they're teaching is false. And that's what we see in Ephesians 4, that we henceforth be no more children, I sort of alluded to this, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love. So we need to tell children the truth. We need to tell spiritual children the truth in love so that they're not tossed to and fro so they need to know this truth so they're not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and they grow up to him, into him in all things which is the head even christ now what's another thing that i see in my children that i can apply to the spiritual realm is they want to avoid hard work right, they don't like doing anything that takes diligence perseverance hard work that's something they need to grow into they want the easy route you know, when, it's, when it takes them to, uh, even my kids, when, they, when they're doing their letters, right, they, they don't mind the colouring in and the things are all fancy, but if you just get them to write out the letter A like 20 times, you know, they get the first line, the second line, it's like, oh, this is too hard. And it's just like, come on, it's so easy just to write the letter a few times. Um, look at what it says here in Proverbs 26. This is what lazy people are like, right? They're always making up these huge excuses. We see here in Proverbs 26, look at this. The slothful man saith, There is a lion in the way, 
A lion is in the streets. They're just coming up with all these reasons why they don't want to do that thing. They don't want to go outside. There's a lion outside that's going to kill me. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Oh, that's just one that gets me because I love sleeping in, right? I'm, that's where I'm slothful in places like trying to get up in the morning. So this is not what we don't want to be. This is the spiritual babes. You know, we need to do things that require diligence, persistence, and hard work. You know, I see my kids sometimes, they, they, you know, we tell them to pick up the toys. You know, they always try and cut corners. You know, we get them to pick up the toys and then, you know, Simon will come back to me and it's like, oh, I picked up all the toys. And then what do you do? You go back, you, you look under the table, and oh, there's toys there. Look under the chairs, toys there. It's almost like they, they don't do a thorough job. And that's what spiritual babes in Christ don't do. They don't do a thorough job. And we don't want to be spiritual children. We want to make sure we do a thorough job when we're doing things for the Lord. You know, children, they, they lack discipline. You know, they lack the attention span to get really good at things. They don't have the patience, right? They want things right now, you know, and they're easily distracted. So it's the same in our spiritual life, right? We need the diligence, but we need to put in the hard work and the diligence so we actually get good at some things. And it's the same with soul winning. Sometimes people go soul winning, they only go once or twice, and they're like, oh, it didn't work. That's not working for me. No, that, that's, a, that's a spiritual babe in Christ where they just want it right now. You know, they've just only started going soul winning, you know, as a silent partner. They don't see anything and it's like, but they just want to, they want to see the soul saved right now, you know, as opposed to working at it and, and being able to, to reap that fruit from their labor. So soul winning. Bible study as well. You know, sometimes people read the Bible through the first time and they're just like, oh, it's too hard. You know, maybe it's the King James Bible's too hard. That, that's not what makes it hard. You know, if you, if you, if you read any, even if you read any translation, if you're not putting in the work to understand it, that's just, that's just as hard to understand as the King James Bible. It's not, like it's, it, it's not like the language makes a difference. I remember once I was talking to somebody about this issue and uh, we, were talking, uh, we were referencing a passage in Isaiah because I was trying to show him, you know, hey, there's some changes here in your Bible and whatnot. And he was reading through Isaiah, the passage we were talking about in the King James, and he's just like, oh, I just don't get what's going on. You know, King James is so hard, so hard to understand. Nobody so I'm like, well, let's read it in your Bible. So then he reads it in his Bible, and he's reading through Isaiah, and he's like, I still don't understand this. That's because it has nothing to do with whether it's in King James English or not. It's just you're not familiar with the passage, right? Because you haven't put the work in and the study in to understand it. It doesn't matter whether you're reading it in the King James or in another type of English. You know, if it's unfamiliar to you, you're not going to get anything from it. Right? So that's why when it comes to the King James Bible, we don't just like it because it sounds like Shakespearean English. We like it because it's accurate, right? because it's true. It hasn't been corrupted. That's why we use the King James Bible. Look at what it says here in 2 Peter 1 in regards to our faith. And beside all this, and beside this, look at this, giving all diligence. So it's not that we just do this just willy-nilly trying to add to our faith these things. This is saying when we try and work our faith, work out our faith, right? We're trying to do it with all diligence. We're doing it thoroughly, right? You think about diligence, you're doing hard work, you're doing it thorough, you're doing a good job. Faithful, add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge and to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. So these are the things we should be striving for spiritually, that as we add to our faith, we're going to grow in our spiritual life. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these th things be in you, look at this, and abound. So you don't just want these things to be in you, like, hey, you have a little bit of patience and that's enough. No, you want patience to abound. You want godliness to abound, brotherly, brotherly kindness to abound, charity to abound. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence, see, to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fail. So it's interesting that in verse 9 he's saying, if you lack these things, you've forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. Now, how do I understand that? I understand that, that people that aren't trying to live for God, it's because they've forgotten what God has done for them. And they've forgotten that, you know, they're, they're taking their salvation for granted, right? They've forgotten what God went through. And that's why when we meet on Fridays, I wanted to go through one of the Gospels because I wanted it to remind us of the life of Jesus Christ 
what he did for us. Oftentimes when we reflect on who he is and what he did for us, it's an amazing thought. It's an amazing truth. So we forget what God did for us, and that's why we don't love as we ought. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now, is that saying that you do works in, in order to know that you're saved? No, right? Because we're not, we're not saved by works. We don't, know, we don't know that we're saved by works. See, I'm not saved by works. That's why works has nothing to do with it. If I knew I was saved by works, I would never know I was saved, right? Just like I can never obtain salvation by works, how can I ever obtain 100% assurance of salvation by works? So this is not saying that you're making your salvation, giving you assurance. This is saying so that you're not moved in your faith, in the sense that if you abound in these things, then you're going to be walking on the right path. You're going to make your calling and election sure. You're not going to fall away from the faith in terms of get out of church, you know, stop living the right life, stop, stop walking in the spirit. You're going to be walking in the flesh. So that's what, it's, what it means there. If you give diligence to these things, then you're going to live the right way. And if you don't give diligence, then it's saying you're going to fall. Right? So that's number five. Number five was they don't want to do any hard work. So when, when we think of our own spiritual life, if you're just trying to avoid the things that are hard, that's showing you that you have some growing to do. Right? You have some spiritual growing to do. If coming to church one time a week is too hard for you, that's spiritual babe in Christ. You know what I mean? Like, that's why it boggles my mind that in our church, I thought, hey, let's just do one meeting a week a bit longer, and that's too hard for people. Whereas church, most churches have so many more times that they meet a week, other activities, other commitments, and if you're complaining and, and finding it hard just to get here weekly, you know, if you're finding it hard just to go soul winning weekly, that's a spiritual babe in Christ. We have to grow to the point. You know, this should, once a week is, is, is easy you know, as, a, as a church member, I reckon, especially if you don't even, uh, not even involved in setting it up and preaching and things like that. Now, number six. Number six is children, they have a problem with authority, don't they? They, they, they disobey, they're disobedient. The Bible says here in Colossians 3.20 about children, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Now, some people confuse obeying your parents with honouring your parents. And some parents confuse that too, right? Because they think honour your parents means I can do my, tell my kids to do whatever, as opposed to if they're adults. You know, they don't need to obey you in all things because they're not children anymore. They just need to honour you in all things. Now, what's the difference between honour? Honour is respect. Honour is providing for your parents when they need help. Obeying your parents is doing everything that they tell you, right? So the Bible never commands everybody to obey their parents. It commands children to obey their parents. But men who are no longer under their parents, they, need to, um, they, they no longer need to obey their parents. They are their own family, but they still should honour their mother and their father. But children have a problem with authority, and spiritual children, they have a problem with authority too. They don't like being told what to do. They don't like rules and regulations. You know, and sometimes there are rules. You know, I'm not a bishop that has a lot of rules, but there are some things that I like done certain ways, you know, and there's a reason why certain things are done certain ways. And a spiritual babe in Christ is going to have a problem with that. You know, they're going to have a problem with, oh, I don't like people telling me what to do. I'm my own person. This is how I like to do it. And then they cause problems because the whole idea of rules is to set in order um, things in the church. Now, I'm not one that's craving authority, you know, in the sense that, you know, I didn't, I didn't, t I didn't take on this role just because I wanted to rule over people. It's about order. It's like in the family, right? It's not that a husband shouldn't have the frame of mind that he just wants the authority just because he wants to control people. No, it's because he's accountable. See, I'm accountable to God for this congregation. That's why there are rules in place. And we have to try and keep things in order. That's why there are certain rules in place of how we do things and to try and keep the peace in certain areas. So spiritual children have a problem with that. But people that have grown in their faith, they don't have a problem with that, right? Because they understand why. It's like children, as you grow as an adult, you start to realize why your parents were so strict, why they disciplined you, why they didn't just let you have whatever you wanted, why they forced you to eat your vegetables, right? Because it was good for you. Right? And it's the same in the spiritual life. There are some things that are good for you. That's why there is authority set in place in the church. Um, one thing as well where I think about uh, children not liking authority, you know, oftentimes children will try and put their parents against each other. Right? 
They say like, well, my mom told me I could do this, that. They're trying to get their parents, you know, that's something that you have to sort of fight with. That's why you have to have a really good relationship, you know, with your wife, because your children are going to try and do that as they get older. And they're going to try and, you know, I've told them to do something and then they get, well, my mommy said I could do it. You know, the right response is, well, who, who, you know, in our family, it's, well, my word goes above my wife's word. So if I said the children couldn't do this and my wife said they could do this, then, you know, then that's, uh, then it goes, goes with me. Uh, but oftentimes as well, if my wife says, you know, they could have done something and then I said no and I didn't know that, you know, I'll, you know it just depends on what the scenario is. But the, the point is you need to be on the same mind. You need to be on the same page because your children are going to try and put you against each other. Now, how does that work with spiritual children? That's the same thing. Spiritual children try and put church leaders against each other, right? And try and cause division and cause strife and try and get people fighting where there really shouldn't be any fight. And people do that. Don't they? You'll see baby Christians run to one bishop, run to another bishop, and it's like, you know, they're trying to put people against each other. And I think that's where, like parents, you know, you need to come together and get an understanding. You know, spiritual bishops will do the same. They'll speak to one another. They'll get an understanding and try and diffuse that situation. <clears throat> now, uh, here in Hebrews 13, I'm just showing you here that there is an authority structure in the church. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and then submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. So it's not that these people ought to be, and I know people obviously abuse their power in congregations and in churches, but see, the reason why they are given this authority is because they watch for the souls of these people. They're accountable to God for what happens in that church. As they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. This is interesting, because see, this is an exhortation not to the, to the rulers here, right? This is an exhortation to the followers, saying there is an authority structure in church and God is saying here, hey, you need to submit yourself to that authority and fall in line according to the word, right? Not going against the word, because obviously I'm meant to be following Jesus and if I'm following Jesus, then you fall in line behind me to make this work happen. And the Bible's saying here that if you submit yourselves uh, as they that give account, I'm not going to do it with grief. Because it's saying here that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Why? For that is unprofitable to you. So, so if you make it hard for church leaders, right? If church members make it hard for church leaders, then they're going to start doing it with grief and it's not going to be profitable to the congregation. So you see how if there's a, there are good church members that, are, that, that do submit to the leadership, that are supportive in that way, then that helps the leaders of the church to do it with joy. And then what does that mean? That it's going to be more profitable to you, right? Because nobody likes doing things where it's, you know, it's like nobody likes doing things where it's just a drag, right? Do you know what I mean? We're talking about these things. If, if, if something's not, you know, if something's just constantly discouraging you, that's going to be a lot more difficult right, then if something is encouraging you, you know, and, that's, and then I'm going to be more profitable to you guys. So that's, that's one way you can think about submitting to, to leadership as well. All right, so that's number six. Number seven is children are selfish. Selfish. So when we're thinking about children, you know, I don't really need to explain to you how children are, right? Children, when they play with their toys, like my kids, they play with their toys, I'm trying to teach them, hey, when we play, try and make it fun for the other person, right? But children don't. Children, it's all about them. They want the toy that they want. They want to play with it the way they want. That's how children think. And spiritual children are the same way, right? They, it's always about them, right? That, that they're the focus of everything that's happening. Uh, you know, they're self, they, they don't have respect for other people's property. You, know, you think about children that aren't taught to respect people's property. They just get something and then just smash it and break it. Whereas spiritual babes in Christ are the same. You know, oftentimes, even in our church, right, when, when we're cleaning up, and we're putting things away, sometimes you'll be tempted. You're like, oh, this doesn't belong. You know, nobody's going to notice. You know, you put the chairs away dirty. You put the tables away dirty. You don't clean that thing. You don't, you don't take care of things as though they belong to God. You think you get away. That's a spiritual babe in Christ. You know, it's like my children. They won't do something properly. They won't clean something properly. They think they're going to get away with it. Spiritual babes in Christ are the same. You know, they don't have a respect for other people's property. How else do, do, do people do things selfishly? They want to be praised and rewarded for every little thing that they do. Think about children are like this. You know, my, my son, he'll do something small. Uh, like when I watch him play soccer, 
He'll like, he'll like get the ball, he'll like pass it to some other player, and when he passes it, he like looks over at me, he's like, <laughs> he wants that acknowledgement, he wants that praise. Spiritual babes in Christ are the same, right? Spiritual babes in Christ, like they want, they want all, every little thing that they do to be acknowledged. You know, just, just attending church, right? It's the smallest thing, that, they were at church, they want to be acknowledged. You know, if they come to church and nobody says hello to them, they're like, oh, I can't believe it. Nobody even acknowledged my presence. I didn't make it to church. Nobody sent me a text. They don't even care that I'm not there. And it's like, when you come to church, it's not that big a deal. It's not that hard to put your seat in a chair and just listen to preaching. But babes in Christ, they, they want that praise. They want to be acknowledged. They want people to know that they're there. It's the same with children. They want every little thing to be rewarded. This is not the mindset we should have as Christians. And it's always a red flag to me when people get offended at these little things like they they help out they they cook you know maybe you brought a side and you're thinking oh well nobody said thank you nobody said anything now is it wrong for them to you know i'm not am i saying people shouldn't be appreciative no but from the mindset of the person serving if you do something for god and then you get discouraged because nobody recognized you nobody said thank you are you really doing it for god yeah. Yeah. have you thought about that you know if, if you're coming to church for god and then you come to church and like nobody says hello to you and you're like, oh, you know, people don't even think I'm here anyway. Did you come for them? Is that why you came to church? Or did you come to church for God? See, I come to church for God. That's why like even if this room's empty, I mean, I, I didn't come here for you. I came for God, right? It's the same when I do something, you got to do it for God. That's how we, and if you do it for God, then it's not going to matter if people don't recognize you because God recognized it. Right? So it's a red flag when people get offended at not being praised or appreciated for every little thing they do because that's how children behave. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I'm just showing you these passages because I, I looked up the phrase whatsoever you do and I just thought hey, there'd probably be a link between this phrase in the Bible. So whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. This is Colossians 3.17 Whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So we see, we're not doing this for man. We're doing it for God, right? So think about that. When you go soul winning, when you go to prayer meeting, when you go to church, when you do things, who are you doing it for? And I think the way you know who you're doing it for is who, whose praise are you trying to get? If you don't get praise from man, are you still glad to do that task? Colossians 3, look at this. Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, look at this, as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he, doeth, uh, which he hath done, and there is no respect of person. So this is a passage teaching that God sees what we do, and if we do right, he's going to reward us. If we do wrong, he's going to punish us. We should be doing all things for the Lord and not for men. So who are you doing this for, right? So children are selfish. They think about themselves, you know, in their interaction. It's all about them. They want the conversation to be about them. They don't respect other people's property. They only care about their own property. They want to be praised for everything they do as opposed to thinking, how can they praise people? How can they um, um, be praised for other things that people do as opposed to their own self? All right, number eight is children take things for granted. They take things for granted. We don't want to take things for granted in our spiritual life. The children often take things for granted. How do you know when you're taking things for granted? When you start complaining about things. You know, children will complain all the time about things. Like my, my son sometimes will be driving back from somewhere and he'll be saying like, oh, this trip is taking so long. And sometimes I'll say to him, well, you can... You can get out and walk home. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, you, you had to walk home, it'd take you a lot longer. You ought to be thankful that we can go to places and drive. You know, you're complaining about how long the trip is, you know, but yet you, we have a car. You, know, you don't have to walk everywhere. Do you know what I mean? So they complain because they, they, they're uh, not appreciative of the things that they have. Now, when I think about complaining, I think about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Look here in Numbers 11. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Right, so they're going through the wilderness and they, they, they want meat. You know, actually, uh, like, uh, I guess in this case it was uh, poultry. <clears throat> look at this. It says here, We remember the fish 
which we did eat in Egypt freely. Now, were they free in Egypt? They weren't free in Egypt. They were in bondage. They were slaves. But yet they say they're talking about back in Egypt. They've forgotten about how hard it is they, because they're taking for granted that God just delivered them by signs and wonders and parted the Red Sea. And now they've just got a little bit of hardship in the wilderness and now they're complaining. They want to go back to Egypt. They want to go back to the servitude, right? Which they were crying out to God for, to send a saviour. He says, uh, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Yeah, but what about the whips? What about the slavery? But now our soul is dried up. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of bdellium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. So this gives you, I don't know if you knew that this was what the manna was like. So if you know what coriander seeds are like, this is what the manna was. So in the, in the morning, it says here, and the taste of it was as a taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. So this is how the manna would appear in the morning. It's interesting that the, you know, the dew in the night, and when they would wake up in the morning, this coriander seed stuff would be on that dew, and they'd go up and gather it, and they'd make it into bread, and it tasted like the taste of fresh oil. So children take things for granted, right? The fact that God had delivered them, God was supernaturally providing for them, yet they're saying, we want to go back to Egypt. Look what it says here about the manna in Psalm 78. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven, and had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven... Look at this, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. Right? So God just didn't give them anything. I mean, God gave them food that only angels ate in heaven and they're complaining about what they're receiving. Right? This is what children do. They, they complain um, because they take things for granted. And oftentimes in our life, right, in our life, we will complain about things because we're taking things for granted. I preached a sermon re recently on giving thanks always. Because why? When we, you know, finance, you know, maybe we'll have financial trouble. You know, maybe like our plans, you know, you know, our party didn't go according to plan. You know, like maybe our wedding or our anniversary or something like our birthday party. Or, you know, we didn't get the job that we wanted. And if you just think about, you know, people get so upset about these things that don't go their way. And it's like, well, how does that even matter in the grand scheme of things? You know what I mean? Why are we complaining about these little things when God has given us life, he's given us health, he's given us the ability to see, the ability to walk, the ability to eat, the ability to hear. We take all these things for granted and at the drop of a hat we complain about how bad our life sucks. <laughs> right? Really? Does our life really suck? No, no, that's, that's being a spiritual babe where you're taking things for granted and it causes you to complain. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect. Now, as we go through these, I don't want you to get the impression that I've just conquered all these things. You know, these are things that I see in my children, I see in myself as well, you know. And we have to grow out of these. Number nine is children are more of a burden than a help, right? Have you ever tried to ask your children to help you clean up? And it's harder to get them to help you to clean It's You know, that's, that's where it's like tempting to just go, you know, just, just, get out, just let me do it myself. You know, that, that's, that's what it's like when you're dealing with spiritual children too, that sometimes people help, they're more, it's harder for them to help you. It's just like, just, just don't help. It's hard to do it myself. That's what it's like sometimes. So with spiritual children, it's the same. You know, they can't see something that needs to be done right in front of their face. You know, sometimes spiritual children are just like, oh, I don't know how I can help. And it's like people are just doing things all around them. It reminds me of like children when, you know, when they, the thing you want them to pick up is right in front of their face. And they're like, where is it? Let's see, where the, what am I meant to pick up? And it's like right in front of their face. It's like that with spiritual children. And you think when they, people are wondering, hey, how can we help at church? You just need to open your eyes and just see what gets done. Right? You know, like see what needs to get done. You know, like things that get done. And, you know, if you, if you see rubbish on the floor... You just pick it up. You know, it's the same like that with, uh, with, with, uh, in, in the spiritual realm in terms of serving God. So children are more of a burden than they are a help. You know, and in our spiritual life, if you're more of a burden than a help, you know, where are you in your spiritual life? When you think about where you are in your spiritual growth, if there was a measure of how much you deposit into the spiritual economy and how much you withdraw, are you a negative balance? You know, are you, have you got this credit card that you're just constantly withdrawing on and you owe interest on? 
And you, you think, you know, I come to church every now and then, I think I'm this great spiritual Christian, but if we could see this spiritual bank balance, you know, how much are we putting into the kingdom of God rather than how much are we taking out? That'll be a measure of our spiritual uh, maturity. Look what it says here in Proverbs 20, verse 6. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. See, everyone thinks they're really great and then do a lot of things, right? But a faithful man who can find, somebody who's trustworthy, somebody who's diligent, that's a very rare thing. It's a very rare thing to find somebody that's dependable, right? It's the same with women. Proverbs 31.10. Who can find, so we see that same passage, that, that same uh, phrase there, who can find a virtuous woman? Right, it's asking these things. For a price is far above rubies because a virtuous woman is a rare thing that works hard, that's involved, that's dedicated. And see, this virtuous woman, she's not just like a pretty picture. Right? It doesn't just have like a nice Facebook profile, right? Where she's, you know, she's dressed up and looks nice. No, she says here in, in verse 13, she seeketh wool and flax this, and worketh willingly with her hands. Right? So a faithful man is diligent and trustworthy. A virtuous woman is one that actually works. Right? If a woman, you know, some women, you know, they have their nails so nice, they can't do anything with their hands. I don't want to ruin their nails. That's a spiritual babe in Christ that, that, that isn't willing to get her hands dirty and work with their hands. Often women that are hardworking and are virtuous, they, they're not able to keep those nice nails. Right? Because they put their, you know, maybe they had their nice nails for a treat, but then they get back to work and they're, they're all ruined again, right? And it's hard for them to maintain these. And I'm, and I'm not a woman, so maybe there are ways that women can maintain these nails and still work out. Hey, if you figured that out, then, then that's good. Right? No, you're working with your hands, you can have the nails too. I know some women, like, they wear gloves, right? They put gloves on and protect them and they can do things. So that's my way. I'm not necessarily against the nails, right? It, the, the point is, if... If, if, if it's working with your hands, right? It's making sure that you're working hard and you're involved in things, getting your hands dirty. <clears throat> What's other ways they're more of a burden than a help? So they don't help when there's an obvious need or lack. Sometimes children, they don't understand why things are done the way they are. You know, I think you're just giving them all these rules as opposed to, no, no, there's a reason why there are things in place. You know, we, we don't just do things for no reason. And children don't understand that. Same with spiritual children. They may not understand why things are done. You give them some rules to abide by and they break them. They don't know a reason why. An example I can give you in, in a church scenario, in, in, even in our scenario, is you know, I tell people, hey, you know, when you open up the fellowship supplies, don't just rip it open, right? And, and people don't listen to that, right? They just go in there, they open up the cups, they open up the plates, and they get them out. They think, oh, I have done my job. And the reason why they don't understand it because they've never had to pack it away, right? So we think uh, the reason why you don't just tear it all open is because we want to put it back into the bag, right? And tie it up so that it's nice and clean for next time. But then people that don't understand those sort of rules, they just tear it up because they they're not considerate about the whole job, the whole task and things like that. So no initiative we already talked about. They have to be told everything, otherwise it won't get done. Think about children. You have to hold their hands to do everything. And it's the same with spiritual children. Spiritual children, you know, if you're not nagging them to come to church, if you're not nagging them to go soul winning, if you're not nagging them to read their Bible, then they're not doing it because you need to hold their hand all the time. Is that the sort of Christian that you are, that you don't do things unless somebody nags you to do it? You know, you don't, you don't go to church unless somebody goes, hey, you're going to go to church? No, a spiritual adult is going to be encouraging others to come to church. Hey, I'm going to church. Who's coming with me? I'm going soul winning. Who's coming with me? Hey, where are you up to in your Bible reading? Are you, what are you learning in your Bible? That's a spiritual adult. But a spiritual child needs to have their hands held to do everything. And the last one I've got, number 10, and this is the last one, so I'm done here, is children don't resolve conflict. Think about children when they play and they don't get along, right? They just get angry with each other and then they play on opposite sides of the room. Right. So with children, it, it's like with my kids. I have to bring them together and say, all right, say sorry, say sorry, hug, you know, and then they're all fine. That's what it's like with spiritual children too. Spiritual children don't want to deal with conflict, right? And the more mature Christians are the ones that have to drag them together and go, let's talk about this, right? Whereas spiritual adults are going to go and resolve the conflict, right? They're not going to, you know, they're not just going to... Um, uh, you know, avoid it. Look at what it says here in Matthew 18. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, 
Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now I think a really important point in Matthew 18, 15 is it's the one that is offended goes and tries to get right with the one that's offended him. Now that is never the frame of mind with people that are offended because when you think I'm offended, he should come to me and apologize. But the Bible is teaching the exact opposite that if somebody does wrong to you, then you go to them. Why? Because they may not even know that they've done wrong to you, right? So they can't read your mind. And also, you know, uh, that's just how it is, right? So if somebody does wrong to you, it's up to you to bring it up to them in love and try and resolve that, right? But what do children do? Children want to avoid that conflict, right? Same with spiritual children. They don't want to avoid it. They just sweep it under the rug and then just have a terrible fellowship as opposed to if somebody's doing something wrong, it's upsetting you. You need to have the spiritual maturity to go and deal with that problem. And look, it says, go and tell him his fault between him and them and him alone. It's not go text him as your fault. You just tell them and then never, never face the person. So I think the reason why here is that you have to face the person. There's some personality there as opposed to just, you know, sweeping it under the rug, which is what baby Christians do. So like I've taught before, it requires love for us to live together and interact together, right? Because we're sinners, we're going to offend each other, we're going to upset each other. We need to have the love and forbearing and forgiving of each other if we're going to have unity here. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So where do you find the strength and the ability to be able to forgive somebody else? It's because when you remember what Christ forgave you of, what Christ did for you, that you, then the, what that person did to you is not going to be that big a deal. I mean, what you did to Jesus Christ mean he, meant he had to go to hell to pay for your sins, and you can't even forgive somebody that just you know, didn't say hi to you or said something the wrong way or maybe said something that you took offense to or things like that. So what's the difference between forbearing one another and forgiving one another? For to forbear is when somebody wrongs you and if they don't want to resolve it, then you put up with it, right? That's to forbear. To forgive somebody is when they actually ask for forgiveness. They apologize and say, please forgive me. Then you have to forgive them, right? So that's the difference between forbearing each other, right? That's putting up with one another. And forgiving one another is when you actually resolve it. If somebody repents and says, sorry, you must forgive them. Now you're the sinner if you don't forgive them. So you've got to go to the one offended. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay. So anyway, those were the 10. I'll just remind us what they were again. So one was they only like sweet food. They hate having their head washed. They're led by feelings, easily influenced. You know, they don't want to work hard. They have a problem with authority. They, they're selfish. You know, they take things for granted. They're more of a burden than a help. And they don't resolve conflict. Now, this is not an all exhaustive list. Because I'm sure those of you that have children, you can think of way more things <laughs> that, that children do or people do. Because ultimately what makes you a babe in Christ is somebody that is walking in the flesh, not in the spirit. And if you walk in the flesh, we need to walk in the spirit so we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh thereof. So last verse is 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Look at this. Howbeit in malice, be ye children. Right? So I didn't talk about that in this sermon, but there are some good traits of children that we ought to emulate, right? The fact that children do have a lot of faith in things, that children don't hold on to hate, that children do forgive really easily. If you think, oh, okay, when my children fight, they absolutely hate each other, and then you bring them together and you're like, okay, say sorry, hug, and then they hug, and then they go back and they're just like laughing. They just forget instantly, right? They're just best friends again. That's how we should be. Like a spiritual children, in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Right? So that's what I want you guys to reflect on today. In your spiritual life, are you still a babe in Christ? You know, these are the things we ought to put away and we need to strive to walk in the Spirit. And then the more we walk in the Spirit, remember, um, by reason of use, the more we read the Word, use the Word, walk in the Word, that's how you grow as a Christian. It's not just going to this church for a long time. Because if you just do that without any of the use, you're just going to stay spiritual babe in Christ. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminder. Help us, Lord, not to be babes in Christ. Help us to grow in our faith. 
Help us to not have the attributes we see in our children, in our spiritual life. And I pray, Lord, that as we grow, you'd help us to have grace to forbear and forgive one another and help us, Lord, in our service to you to do things diligently, do things the right way and, and be a leader in our, in our spiritual life, in our circle of influence. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.